Welcome, welcome. <laughs> this is the Enlightenment Show, and I'm your host, Laurie Schoenfeld. This is where Chicken Soup for the Soul meets the artist way with Nancy Drew. Our guest today is Paul Wayne, musician and music producer. We're going to be chatting with him today all about his journey and how music has supported him through the challenges in his life. Hello, Paul. Welcome. Thank you. How are you doing? I am great. I am so excited to be here today chatting with you. Yeah, me too. You're a musician, which of course, I have to ask, what's the first instrument that you learned? Uh, guitar. Yes. Yeah. Yes. What age were you when you learned guitar? Oh, I was probably 16. Yeah. Now, how many instruments do you know how to play and which ones? Drums, bass, piano, uh, harmonica, guitar, and I know how to write uh, other instruments like strings and things to add into the music. So that's what I've kind of learned and taught myself is to how to actually write the MIDI or actually write out the musical notes. So I can then add a virtual instrument on some of those things that I can't necessarily play or have friends that can play them. Mm -hmm. So if you started guitar when you were 16, did you uh, pick up guitar and then learn a little bit along the way with different instruments and then implement those pieces together? Or how did that come to be? Um, I actually started learning a lot of the other instruments um, mostly along the way, but then I really got into it at about 2019 when I actually started to do uh, you know, recording and then mixing and mastering. So I have learned all of that too. Uh, I didn't know how to do all of that. So it was kind of funny when I first started playing, it was just being a guitar. And I didn't know how to actually make it sound better. But over time, I've gotten all of the equipment and I started learning and it's a, it's a process. Mm -hmm. I love that you picked that up though, Paul, in 2019, you were like, okay, this is what I need to do. I don't know yet how to do this and just yeah. went with the flow of trying to figure out first how to teach yourself multiple instruments, but then how to compile and put it all together. I'm sure it's a process in and of itself. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So what does that look like, Paul, a day of putting, you know, producing your music and putting those different sounds and instruments together? Well, I first start out by actually writing the music, uh, the lyrics. Um, all of the lyrics that I've written are personal. Uh, they come from things that I've been through, experienced, whatnot. And once I kind of start writing the lyrics and I kind of start plucking around on the guitar to kind of find the chords that sound right with that type of song, you know, the mood. Um, once I kind of got that down, then it's starting to build it up from there, adding other instruments, adding uh, I love synthesizers. I actually got into that with my first and second album. I got into synthesizers. I loved it. And so I just start building from there as far as the chords, and maybe I'll change them, maybe I'll change some of the lyrics to make them fit in what, what I'm trying to do. And so it's kind of like this building process. And once I finally get the instruments sounding good, then that's when I actually record the vocals. And then from there, once I feel like everything's sounding pretty good, then I start to mix and master it together. Okay, so time frame, because there's a lot of beautiful moving pieces going at different yeah. stages. Time yeah. frame, how long would you say it takes you to usually not only write the song, but then to put those instrument pieces together and all the elements that are needed to have it ready for production? It really depends on the song, depending on what I'm really trying to reach. Um, I can spend average about two days to sometimes a week, because if I really add a lot of instruments and I really have to flesh all of that out, 
it sometimes can take a little bit longer, especially with the mixing and mastering process. Uh, but average, I could probably do what I would consider a basic song, probably within two days, two and a half days, uh, something that uh, where I really want to flesh it out and really find that sound. It could take up about a week. Mm -hmm. When did you decide that you wanted to be a musician and a music producer? <laughs> I think it's always been in my blood. You know, I love music. Um, I grew up with a father that was always playing music uh, in, you know, just on the radio. And I actually have a really young picture of me when I was a baby with headphones on. And I just had this face, just like, what is this? <laughs> and I think I just fell in love with it. And, but I didn't get that, like, I want to do this until probably when I was in high school. I used to fan, I used to actually like follow all the bandos around. And I would like bring my guitar, even though I didn't really know how to play really well, I would sit there and I would listen to them play and watch how they played. And I just started to pick it up and I actually taught myself. I never actually went to class for anything. It was, it was interesting because the very first CD that I bought was actually the Beatles. And I fell in love with them. I mean, I, I was one, I was actually the weird kid in elementary school listening to like, you know, KRF 101, you know, it's California. So I was listening to that. I was listening to Oldie Station. And when I heard the Beatles for the first time, I was like, I want to be able to play these songs. So I went out, got a guitar and started to play. And I learned how, you know, where to put your fingers on the guitar and start to figure all that out. And it just gradually got better and better where my musical experience got like more songs, more, you know, everything going on where I just kind of took off from there. And, but I, music has always kind of been that healing walk for me to kind of just get away from the day to day of my life and kind of put myself into this musical. I want to create music. I want to play music. And it was just something that was always kind of healing for me. Mm -hmm. Now, being self-taught, do did you do ear training? Was it practice of, you know, find those notes and continuing to keep repeating what you learned, a combination of both? What did that look like for you? It was kind of a combination of both. I mean, I kind of started to... You know, it's like I learned like a C chord and I just kept playing and playing and playing until I could get my fingers right without, you know, buzzing the strings. And then I just kind of moved to the next chord and the next chord and so on and so forth. And then next thing I know, I'm actually playing a whole song. And, but along the way, I picked up the ear training because then you get to, you get kind of used to what, what, the, what those uh, chords sound like. And so now, listen to music a lot differently than I used to. I listen to the instruments. I listen to how they're sounding. And, it, you know, because like people listen to it and they like the beat or they like the lyrics and stuff. I like all of that, but I'm actually listening like, oh, wow, okay, that's a synthesizer coming in. Oh, wow, that's a harmonica <laughs> coming in. Okay, they're, you know, and I start to kind of like, well, what are they actually playing? Oh, okay, it's in the key of D minor. Okay. Yeah. And I can start, you know, filling it out from there. So it was kind of like, yeah, it was kind of like I started out with a combination of both and then kind of got more advanced where I can listen to most songs and, and know how to play them. Mm -hmm. You've had three kidney transplants, cancer, dialysis, and six months on life support. Yes. Where did that all begin? Uh, from birth. Yeah, when from birth, I I was born with a rare disease that basically only had one partially working kidney. And by the age of five, they're like, oh, he needs a transplant. So I had my first one when I was five. And uh, I had my second one when I was 12. And my third one I had when I was 32. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've had a lot of stuff in between that just it strengthens you for sure and you you 
look at life a little bit differently. You also look at people differently, especially ones that are having health issues as well. I have I have so much sympathy for people who have health problems. I understand a little bit of what they're going through. It's not easy. It's not something I enjoy. It's not, you know, just like going to Disneyland or not, going to dialysis is not like going to Disneyland for me. It's it's mm-hmm. hard. Um, and especially this is my third run on dialysis and it's not, uh, there isn't any way out off of the dialysis right now. Uh, a fourth transplant was not something that they were willing to do. Um, and I'm kind of waiting for technology to catch up. There's a thing called a bioartificial kidney that's supposedly supposed to come out in 2020, but then now it looks like maybe 2025. Um, that could do so much for people, uh, get people off dialysis, get them on with their life and never have to look back again. Whether that's for me or not, that's to be seen because I've had so many surgeries and had so many other health issues that they're probably not really looking at when they're creating this device. Um, and unfortunately, the cancer happened when, because of the medications you're on to help you, so you don't reject your transplant, actually over time can cause cancer. So I actually had thyroid cancer, which wasn't the worst, but it was shocking when you go in there and they're like, oh, you got something here. Let's do a biopsy. Oh, wow, you got thyroid cancer. So I had to take that all out. And, um, and unfortunately, the six month on, you know, life support was because of the third transplant. Um, no, because the more transplants you have, unfortunately, there's a place where they go, we got to start digging down at the bottom of the barrel for you because you have an immune system that's built up now. You're not going to have the, you know, the primo uh, transplant. So it came with CMV. And I never had it. And they did not check things as clearly as they should have and they took me off the medications soon and it just exploded all over my system i mean i had millions upon millions upon millions of copies all over i had it in my brain my retina everywhere but my kidney that i had so i went in i remember i went into the hospital i wasn't feeling too good and by that night never woke up I was on life support. I stopped breathing and I had severe pneumonia. Like it was so bad that even when they did an x ray, it was all cloudy. They couldn't even see my lungs. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was just one of those things that happened where the doctors could tell that I was fighting, that I wanted to live. So they were willing to go above and beyond to try to save my life. And they, they, I remember the my mom and dad told me all of this stuff. The uh, immune, uh, the infectious control doctor would come in maybe about six o'clock at night and leave about eleven o'clock at night or eleven uh, six o'clock in the morning and leave about eleven o'clock at night. And he was just researching stuff, trying to find a way to save me. Mm-hmm. And it got to a point where they were going to have to. They were pulled my parents aside and says, "You're going to have to pull him off life support." The machine isn't keeping him going. It's it's getting worse. We're not able to do any more for him. So my mom and dad came in the next morning and said a prayer. And the next thing they knew, uh, they started looking a little bit better. Um, the doctor had found a experimental medication that just so happened to have enough up in L.A at the time uh, it was really hard to find but it just so happened to be up there but the bags were you know probably about that much and i had to have six of those twice a day and they were about five thousand dollars each wow and the medic it, it wasn't working as well as they had hoped so they took me off all my transplant meds so they were like yeah his transplant's basically gonna fail in probably less than a week um but it kept going and it actually got better um, and it never failed. And they've been, they never put me back on all the medications when I actually left the hospital. Eventually I was able to come off and wake up and where they could get me off, you know, 
take me off the machine, but I still had a trach. And the doctor came in that day, I remember telling me that I would never talk or never walk again. And I remember, you know, pointing to the pencil and the paper on the, on the desk in front of me. And it felt like it was like 20 pounds when I looked at the pencil because I had no, I didn't have any like muscle. It was all gone. Mm-hmm. And I remember writing in the worst way that possibly I could saying, I will walk out of here. I will talk again. And the next day they got occupational therapy, physical therapy, uh, you know, physical therapy in there for me to get me out, out of bed. And I just, I remember the first time they set me up, I actually flopped back because I had no muscle in my back or anything to hold me up. It was a long journey, but unfortunately my vocals never came back the way that they used to be. And I've really tried to work on it, but I eventually left the hospital and then I had to spend another three months in a nursing home to recover and try to regain my strength again. You know, I kept falling and dropping stuff. And so I spent another three months in a nursing home. Mm -hmm. Um, It was not fun. Mm -hmm. So those three months, it sounds like, you know, working on that muscle, but also those motor skills, I would imagine after being off li- on life support, um, thinking wise and comprehension, was there some fogginess and some motor skills of like reconnecting some of those pieces as well? Yeah, I, unfortunately, I got to a point when I got off life support and tried to return back to life, but I, I couldn't work again. I actually had accumulated uh, incurable neuropathy. So I, sometimes I, I, my feet go numb, my hands go numb and I can't feel them for you know a few seconds to a few minutes, uh, which unfortunately affects my guitar playing. So I have to stop. Mm-hmm. And then I've learned to come back and remember where I stopped at. And then I can kind of splice them together. So it sounds like one continuous play. Mm-hmm. Um, I've had to deal with a lot of different side effects. Uh, I do have dogginess, uh, especially with dialysis, uh, remembering things sometimes, or having conversations uh, is, is hard, you know, remembering words or things. Um, I, but I did have some side effects, but not as bad. I mean, let's just put it this way. The type of CMB that I had and the amount that I had, 96% of the people that get it as bad as I did die. So I, at least coming away, not totally unscathed, but at least I'm alive. Um, I'm thankful for that at least. Well, we're very grateful that you're here with us today and talking to us today as well. Thank you. What is dialysis like? Can you kind of walk through the process of that and what that does for you? Uh, Yeah, so I have a fistula. Uh, which is uh, they take an, uh, a vein in an artery and they splice it together to kind of make a an area that they can stick about 15 gauge needles in. And so you have blood in and blood out. So basically they have a machine that cleans your blood at a rapid. So it takes the blood out, cleans it, puts it back in and just continuously does that for about four hours. Um, you can have complications like you can start cramping your blood pressure could drop which i've had all of those things where you black out even it gets so bad uh you get a little bit of weak weakness after dialysis uh fogginess um sometimes you can bleed which you know depends on you know your fistula and all that uh, mm. all of that um but it's basically what it does. I mean, it just basically just cleans your blood and they give you some nutrients and things in the machine that your body can't, you know, you can't actually produce anymore. So, you know, they kind of have to re- help with rebuilding your blood cells up because it gets low. Uh, they give you iron in the machine. Um, I actually, I, haven't, I don't have to have iron because I do really well with, you know, what I eat and stuff. You do, you're on a restricted diet. You can't drink, like you can probably drink 16 ounces a day. That's about it. 
Mm. Uh, and you have to be careful what you eat as far as like no high potassium or high sodium or high phosphorus things. So, but because of how long I've been doing this, you figure things out. And I am not what I consider I'm not on the restricted diet. I eat what I want, but I eat it in moderation. Um, if I drink a little bit more one day, I drink hardly anything the next day. So I actually have exceptional labs and I'm actually feeling a lot better than most people do on dialysis. I'm doing a lot better than most. Mm -hmm. um, there is an unfortunate life expectancy on it. Um, depending on how well you're doing, um, most people, there are people going past 20 years now. It used to be about 10 years was average. Um, I've been on it for about six years, seven years now. This is so the last time I was on, I was on for about nine years before I got my transplant. But because I don't have that option right now, I don't really know what the ex expectations is for what is going to happen in the future at this point. Mm -hmm. How have these experiences changed your perspective on life you mentioned a little bit about you know you have more empathy for those who are also going through struggles and illnesses yeah how else has that changed your view on life with your journey i think it actually makes you stronger you have more perception of things um i think that you can, I find that I can go through things that most people can't. My pain threshold is actually a lot higher. So somebody might be complaining at a three and I'll be like, yeah, maybe I feel a little bit at the seven. Uh, you know, so it's just a little different, but um, I think that you have a better understanding of life and what life is really about. Um, for me, you know, I can't go out and travel around the world and do the things that I want to do, all of that. So I see life as a temporary stop up. Mm -hmm. um, and I try to do the best that I can with what I have. Sometimes, I'll be honest with you, sometimes I get a little envious or jealous of those people that can go off and live their life the way that they want and not have too much of a care in the world. Mm -hmm. But I think for me, I think what I've really gained from all of this is just to have more empathy of people going through struggles. Uh, I mean, I could give you a brief story. I had a friend when I was working, when I was younger, I was working at a theater in the box office and I had a friend that had some um, uh, physical disabilities. He was they allowed him to rip the tickets and stuff, and he would have a hard time with that. Anyways, he and I went to lunch one day, just next door, and we were walking, and there's some kids uh, tripping, and he fell on the ground, and they were laughing. And I was on dialysis at the time, so I had, he was probably about, uh, probably about 220 pounds. Tried to lift him up. I couldn't pick him up off the ground. He couldn't actually push himself up you know, because of the disabilities and stuff. And I just didn't know what to do. Nobody was helping. People were just walking by. Some were snickering, laughing, because he was just, you know, he was in pain and he was trying to get up off the ground. And I remember I said a little prayer. I was like, please just give me a little bit of strength here. I got to be able to help this guy. And I remember I reached down and I actually was able to pick him up off the ground and just kind of lift him up and get him up on his feet. And I just, you know, brushed him off and we went to lunch and he started to cry. And he said, thank you. Thank you for, for helping me. Thank you for, for not leaving me. And he says, you're my best friend. And no one would have done that for, for me. And I just remember I said, you know, Matt, it's okay. You know, you're, I love you. You're a good guy. And I, I'm sorry those kids were being no bung holes, but you know, I just, I don't know. I, I just felt for him with what he has to go through and the fact that I'm glad I was there to help him up off the ground. 
good thing you were there. Yeah. In that moment yeah. too. Yeah. You love 40s and 90s music era. What are some of your favorite songs and why? <laughs> I thought you said this was going to be a 45 minute show. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have what I would call an ebb and flow. I mean, I can listen to, you know, like Harry Como. And the next day I'm listening to Ozzy Osbourne. <laughs> um, I, I love the Beatles. So that was kind of my first introduction to the music. And a lot of the things that I do and a lot of the things that I do with mixing and mastering uh, resembles a lot of their stuff, you know, the way that they get things too. Um, I mean, I, I actually love the eighties and I love synthesizers. And I, so there's like, there's like, a, like sometimes when I'm really struggling with things, I don't know why, but I, I tend to fall back on the eighties a little bit because it's a little bit energetic. It's a little bit happy. I love the music. There's a lot of instruments going on. And like, I love Duran Duran and like Depeche Mode. Uh, you know, like the cure and things like that. So I'll go like the like the eighties and I'll just like spend like a month watching movies in the eighties too. I love eighties movies. And I'll spend like the, in this eighties. Like when life is a little bit difficult, there's a lot of things going on around the world. I'll be like, I'm gonna go live in the eighties for a while, it's a better time. Um and then I kind of like go into like the nineties and like the nineties was to me like the last era of rock. You know, there's just not really it, it didn't really extend into the 2000s very much. It was kind of like, that was like the last year of like the really good music, like last generation of good music or whatever. So I just kind of like, I love, I'm kind of getting into like this, like this, you know, because of the way I'm dressing now, but I'm kind of getting into like the thirties and forties. Mm -hmm. uh, it's relaxing. I love like the instruments. I love how there was this combination of like orchestra, horns and just kind of like really good singers mm -hmm. and so i think it kind of really depends on what i'm feeling and sometimes a lot of that is, affects the music that i actually produce too because you'll you can usually tell like my first album i was really into like synthesizers and i just did instrumental stuff i didn't even sing because i was like oh, i don't know if i'm really comfortable with my voice and by the time I got into my like second and third album, I actually started to sing a little bit. And I was playing around with like the instruments and my vocals. And by the time I got to my fourth album, I was like on fire. I mean, I did everything I did was just, it was kind of like I was experimenting a little bit. By the time I'm doing my fifth album, which is the one I'm working on now, it's kind of like this rock metal thing. I'm really, experimenting with like pushing my vocals to the limit but finding that i still can't bring my vocals to where it used to be you know singing those highs uh so i try to trick it a little bit with trying to you know uh <laughs> maybe i try to do a little bit of mixing and mastering magic on my vocals a bit um, I don't like auto tune, so I don't usually. I tried it out. I didn't really like it, so I kind of moved away from it. But I've learned how to kind of like use some trickery, I guess, to kind of make it sound a little bit bigger than it really is. Use like the different tones and the echoes and the vibrato. It's the voice yeah. is a very fun instrument, too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I just kind of learned how to just kind of play with that and kind of add some fullness to it and i think you know I, I i looked up how like for instance like how like ozzy does his because if you listen to him talk it's like oh shit, okay. you know you can't really understand it but then when he sings it's nice and clear and i'm like how does he make his voice sound like the way he is well he sings his vocals he sings his vocals four times and then on certain syllables and certain words, he'll actually add another one on top of that. 
and he adds different effects on the different vocals, or I guess his, you know, his audio engineer does. And that actually brings things out. So I actually have started to do that a little bit. So I, I can, you know, play with it and sing a bunch of different times and finally get that sound that I've been looking for and have it sound, you know, better than it did when I first started. Mm -hmm. We're going to take it to the inner child question segment. Are you ready, Paul? Yes. Yep. When you were a kid, what was one of your favorite sounds? Oh, man. Um, I, I think, you know, my, my dad was really into cars. I mean, you could ask him anything about a car. He could tell you how many years they built it, what engine was in it, all of that. So he was always working on some type of vehicle, whether it was a snowmobile or motorcycle or car. And I think just hearing that sound as a child, at first it was scary because it was like, you know, you can hear it in the garage and get a little scary. But then when you're out there and you're listening to it and you're part of it, I actually really like that sound of, you know, of, of my dad working on that, on the cars. And, you know, I never got that interest like he was my mind went to music and his was you know more of you know the cars and everything like that but i think that i really grew up liking that kind of sound mm -hmm. and, and um so I, I guess that's what it would be as, as a kid you know and and then when i got a little older i think the other one was we used to take bike rides along the beach and i love the beach sound just that mm -hmm. you know, the waves crashing against the the beach and just that sound you know, just the, the beat sound, I guess. I kind of really like that. I kind of missed that, actually. It was nice, relaxing. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing the waves as you're talking about it because I really enjoyed that sound, too. And it's been it's been a hot minute <laughs> yeah, yeah. since we've been on the coast, too. But yeah. relaxing. Yeah. Second question, Paul. What is the oddest food combo that you've liked and tried or you've just tried? I love sushi. I mean, I don't, I mean, there are different ones that I like, but it's just one of those really relaxing foods that I really like. It's just something I really enjoy. And I know a lot of people don't. And especially like if you're like in California, you know, they make like the best sushi. You're, there isn't anywhere you go that doesn't taste that great. Um, here it's a little bit harder to find uh, mm -hmm. some that tastes really really good, um, and of course I'm a pizza hound. So, and that's one of the things I can't have a lot, but I'm like, you know, I don't care. I mean, I'm going to have it at least once a week if I can, and even three times a uh, you know three times a day if I could. But you know, I just love pizza. But I think sushi is just one of those things. Like Oriental food is just I love cooking, and I've and I've gotten into this phase of like being experimental with food and learning how to cook it. It wasn't that long ago, probably like 10, 15 years ago, all I could do is spaghetti. And I was like, yes, I can do spaghetti. Now <laughs> there's so many dishes. I mean, I actually even like getting my own recipe book together to of things that I like or things that I want to try. Mm -hmm. And I kind of like, I guess I conjure up my Gordon Ramsay when I cook because when I'm in the kitchen and I'm cooking, get out of my way. I'm cooking here <laughs> <laughs> because it's like, I'm trying to like get everything. And it's like, you know, people are all, all around me and stuff. I'm actually pretty nice with my, my with my wife though. I'm like, you know, I, I don't get as upset about it, but I'm still like I'm in cooking mode. You're like, I'm in creative station. I need my space. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I've actually made a couple of sauces just out of off the top of my head. I'm like, you know, this, I think this would go well together. And I've, and sometimes I'm like trying to find like an oriental sauce that just they don't taste good. So I actually made my own that actually came together really well. Uh, I actually made a peanut sauce because I could, again, I didn't really like what I was finding in the stores. So I actually come up with my own and made my own and I put it on like, I make like a Thai pizza with the peanut sauce on it that's there. And Ooh. yeah, it's good. Or like you can use it in like a, another one is sometimes I'm in this like, 
getting away from like spaghetti sauce. So I actually mixed it in with the noodles that have like a peanut sauce with noodles. Mm -hmm. um, it actually made it really good. And I was surprised. I was like, okay, that was good. I like that. It's healthier. <laughs> I love sauces. And th that's yeah. one of my favorite things is trying yep. new sauces. So you're speaking yeah. my language here, Paul. <laughs> yeah, I have to have a sauce. I don't like dry food. So it's like I have to come up with a sauce for it because it just makes it better. 100% mm -hmm. agree with you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Before we end today, Paul, can you share with our listeners and viewers what living a creatively abundant life means to you? You know, I think it's mostly just being able to create and connect with people on, on, on all kinds of levels. I mean, I can go on Facebook and I can write things and I can talk to people, but I think it's also being able to connect with people through music that I have found like in my own journey of listening to music, hmm. there are certain songs that are healing songs. When you're really going through something difficult, you want to hear something that saves your life. And I think that I try to write my music in that way too. When somebody listens to it, they go, I love the way that this was written. It helped me. I was feeling depressed today. I was feeling all kinds of things. Mm. Um, you know, some of the songs that I've written, like I wrote one called Tormented Mind. And a lot of people are thinking, oh, you know, were you dealing with something? I'm like, no, it was a friend of mine that actually committed suicide. Mm -hmm. And I wrote that for, for him that talks about people going through difficult things. You know, people that have, especially during COVID, there was a lot of things that happened where people were just feeling really lost. And I actually wrote Double Heart for the amazing women that I have actually connected with online. And I wrote that for them, that they are rebel hearts. They are these women that go out and they, I think they, I think they struggle a little bit more than men do with the music because they, I think, unfortunately, and I, I hope I'm not saying something wrong, but I think most, sometimes pe people online that are women are actually like getting compliments because of the way they look, not the music they create. Mm -hmm. Whereas men are more like they get compliments because they they rock and they create wonderful music, and so I wanted to write something that connected to women and and expressed my appreciation for what they do. And so I think for me, I think it's just being able to connect with people on it on all kinds of different levels. And also, I find that the, the people that I connect with, you know, they kind of give me ideas too, of like how I could be better as an artist and as a person. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's what it really comes down to for me. Thank you so much for joining us today, Paul. It has been such a pleasure getting to know you and hearing your story. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Absolutely. And where can our listeners and viewers find you if they have any questions for you after the show? Um, I'm on Facebook as uh, Glass Iron Syndrome. And uh, from there, there I have, I'm on Linktree, which they can find all of my links on there. Uh, but if they just search for me, Glass Iron Syndrome, they can find everything they need on there. Okay. And we will put that in the comments. So it's an easy link for you to connect okay. to Paul as well. Thank okay. you for those who have joined us live today and will join on the replay. Remember, as you go about the rest of your week to find the things that are working for you, you are the creator of your own story. What steps will you take next? Thank you everyone for joining us. Have a lovely week and thank you so much, Paul. Take thank care. You. Bye. Thank you.